Hello, everybody, and welcome to how Macintoshes used to look like 20 years ago. We are going to be going over some games by Richard White. They were hosted by Spiderweb Software uh, at the time. You may know Spiderweb Software from games that are still sold today, such as Avernum or uh, Avedon. However, Richard White no longer has his games hosted by Spiderweb Software. This is the first game that he's created called Oceanbound. And we are going to start by building a house and a storage shed. Oceanbound is basically a top-down survival puzzle game where you have to chop down trees, grow food in order to survive. And as you can see, I'm building some roads around. You can build farms adjacent to the roads, and you can have your workers work along the roads, but it needs to be next to the road. The actual buildings have to be adjacent to each other. Now, the primary mechanic of the game is that you start off with a pool of survivors. In this case, you can see we have 24. If you look next to the man with the blue shirt there, and you can uh, assign a certain amount of people to work a task, in which case you can see that we have eight people working as guards, eight people as farmers, and eight people as woodcutters. Now, I have just constructed a shipyard there. You can see I am filling up the blue bar, and the lion attacked me. That's what happens when you don't have enough houses, so we are going to build more houses. Now, right now, we don't have any corn. We are going to get some corn in a bit here. You start off with a certain amount of meat, and that kind of tides you by until you can actually set up uh, some farms in a farming community. Now, after after a while, you can see under the mini-map, that blue bar is slowly going to turn green. That Once that bar is completely green, we have one level. Now, because it takes a certain amount of time to actually build a boat it's it's uh, after a while it becomes more of a more of a management and survival game here now in this screen here you can see how farms work now stuff will regrow and grow over time such as trees and farms however there is a diminishing uh, rate of returns with them so after you harvest them for the first time you will you won't be able to get the same amount back so it goes from 40 to 30 now, I actually quite like this mechanic because it basically means that you have to slowly expand your borders in order to survive and sort of uh, kind of puzzle everything out in that sense. Because if you don't use your farmland wisely, you have a very limited amount of farmland. Uh, if you don't use it wisely, then you will eventually run out and starve to death. almost done filling the bar up to blue you can see the green is creeping up here i'd say that i'd say that the biggest drawback of the game is that as you can see the bar is fully blue and now we're just kind of waiting we're just sort of waiting for the bar to become green and we're just going to be expanding our farmland to do so it would be, it would have been real nice if something kind of occurred late game maybe uh, you'd have people attack your settlement or something something that you could sort of focus on while the boat was building. But you know, these games are, this game in particular is 20 years ago. The this game design wasn't as, wasn't as refined back then. It was just how games were. Now, as you can see, you can adjust how many workers you actually have working particular tasks. You'll notice that instead of having, because we lost two people, I have changed it to seven farmers and seven woodcutters as opposed to seven far or eight farmers and eight woodcutters and this is so that i could still have three tasks going on at once the more people you have working a task the quicker the task is performed and completed now as we will as we progress through the levels the games the game will actually introduce new terrain types and uh, new opposition the uh, we will eventually see sort of uh, tribal villages that will attack villagers who are working next to them and you can you can put like a guard 
next to that village and it will negate the effect but you know that it's a very because the area they affect is so small it and it's it's not really a you can just sort of go around in most cases it's it's kind of a uh more of a side thing it doesn't really affect the main gameplay is what i'm trying to say So as you can see, we are kind of entering that phase that I mentioned earlier, but we're just we're just kind of waiting and expanding our farmland. And because because food uh, has a marginal rate of returns, we have to continue to expand. And, uh, and the sort of unfortunate aspect of waiting is that I like the mechanic. The mechanic actually makes a lot of sense, and it actually turns the game more into a puzzle game rather than sort of a straight up survival. I think a lot of survival games nowadays are are quite boring, where they just basically uh, devolve into babysitting a bunch of uh, stats, rather than actually trying to survive. But this game is very, very uh, uh, transparent with the fact that it's more of a puzzle game to begin with. It's about managing people. You know, and... and yeah, so a lot of uh, this is a common theme with a lot of Richard White's games. They they have some good ideas. They have some decent mechanics. The game design is holds up to a certain extent even by modern standards. But at that same time, they, they always they always don't quite make it, you know. They they don't quite you know, uh, cut the cheese as it were. And it, it would be nice. I'll. I, I think there is certainly a fine line between between uh, having the game be sort of uh, taking a little bit and sort of being kind of just sort of a slog to get through. This level lasts maybe ten minutes, and and really, I think that it, it might. I'm increasing the speed again to no limits here. Whoa. Okay. Uh, but. I, I do think that, you know, if, if you're going to have a game this small, it could work if you were to reduce the amount of time that the levels would take. Like, for example, we're about halfway there. Imagine if the level ended right now. That would be that'd be about perfect, actually. And I think we're about five minutes in as well. So it would be it would be a good little a good little crunch game. You know, you just kind of a popcorn game, as it were. But no, we're gonna we're gonna keep planting some corn here. Now, yes, uh, the the farms, as I said, will eventually degrade in the amount of food that you get from them. It starts at 40, and then it becomes 30, and then 20, and then 10. And you won't get less than 10. But at that point, it's it's just not worth the time, or, you know, the because it takes the same amount of time to plant, the, and it takes the same amount of time to harvest. And to do, and roads are free. Roads are free. Eventually, in the later levels, we will have to build bridges. Bridges cost a little bit of wood, I think. So it is something that you kind of have to plan for. I know that on we'll see level two for a few seconds. And level two will consist of like an island of trees in the middle of an island of farms. So you have to so you have to get to that island and kind of prioritize getting there so that you can get the wood. But at the same time, you can't start on that island because there's not enough room to farm and there's not enough room to build any buildings. Should be wrapping up uh, in a couple minutes here. Yeah. The so in the meantime, the the with the three uh, pro professions that you can have your workers on, the the only one that re the ones that really matter are the farmers and the woodcutters. The guards aren't super important because the only thing they can do is uh, gar garrison a village.
And we escaped from Island 1. Hooray! Okay, let's take a sneak peek at Island 2, and then we will switch to the last island so you can kind of see how things evolve here. As you can see, you can see that island full of trees in the center there. So here's Island 7 here. And this is this is the final island in the demo that uh, I, ha I have on my computer here. There's an example of the native tribes down there that will attack your villagers. And so as you can see, it can get it can get pretty um, pretty strategic at a certain point because uh, especially when you kind of get to the certain islands there, where they only have one or one resource on them. But let's move on to another one of Richard White's games, Lost Souls, created in 1999. Uh, D Dark Souls ripped off this game actually. I had, to, I had to restart my computer here, so just, uh, not the computer, but the emulator, so just excuse that hiccup there. We are going to start the game. Now, Lost Souls, I, I actually quite like a bit. It's, it's pretty much sort of a territory control chess game, I suppose. It's, it's quite unique, even by modern standards. Uh, the basic idea of the game is that you have to capture all of your opponent's territory. You can only spawn units in your own territory. You can see I built a knight there. You actually have three different kinds of units that you can spawn. And all of them are, are fairly different, and they actually all do serve a purpose, which is quite nice in a strategy game. Because I actually end up using all three throughout the level here. You uh, On the top there, you have a knight. He is the most expensive, but he can move two squares. So that's that's very nice, especially for kind of cracking through defenses and such. Now, in order to uh, get resources, speaking of being expensive, you have to capture those little watchtowers there. So as you can see, I've built a bridge up to the watchtower in the upper right so that I can capture it. And those watchtowers will give you a passive generation of uh, the green stuff in the lower left, I suppose, that, that gives you... That kind of acts as the currency in the game. Uh, but with uh, with the units there, you can see I'm building an archer. Uh, they are the ones with the pointy hats, and their gimmick is that they can when they attack somebody, they do not move into the space that they attack. So that's actually really handy for choke points. And the soldier at the bottom here, he is he is just cheap. He moves once, he can attack once. He's he's just fairly cheap. But he's also quite nice if you just want a numerical advantage, for instance. Now, a lot of the level design, the level design definitely does take advantage of the of the mechanics quite well. And that's that's what I do like about the game. The AI is fairly competent, almost challenging at times. It uses the mechanics quite well. It uses uh, the units to their full effect. It also uses roads uh, as well. As you can see, they're actually starting to attack me here. Uh, I just demonstrated that the archer does not have to move when it attacks, uh, but the knight does. Uh, the roads on the map will actually give your units an extra square to move when they move into the road, not when they start in the road, annoyingly enough. But the AI does actually take advantage of that quite frequently. So yes, the, the AI is, is competent, and it does take advantage of the mechanics, which is quite nice. And, uh, and the rules are fa fairly simple to understand, and it's fairly easy to get the hang of after, after a while. So I do think that it's a, it's a fairly well put together little game. Uh, yes, yeah, so as you can see, we're kind of reaching the sort of choke point in the game. Most of the levels are actually kind of built like this, where you start off on an island, and you have a little bridge, and then you kind of have the enemy area. Uh, the reason for that is because the you can't spawn a unit on the bridges, so I suppose it's sort of a way to create a choke point, as it were, where you have to sort of reinforce from the outside. But on the plus side, you can build as many bridges as you want. You'll notice I built a few in order to get to that middle island right there. So you can build as many bridges as you want. 
And now I'm going to try to do something sneaky in a few turns here. I'm going to try to build a bridge down to their island and sort of flank them, as it were. We'll see if that works out uh, well here, but we're just going to end our turn for now. And as you can see, I, I have these expensive knights here, and they can move tw uh, they can move twice. But I'm, I'm kind of regretting building so many knights at this point because I can't really move more than one square without hitting the bad guys, as it were. So in this case, it, it would be nice to be able to have some soldiers instead of knights. So just because the knights are better in uh, many respects, they still, they still you know, uh, don't completely replace the soldiers. And now I'm going to try to open it up a little bit there too by building a bridge next to their island and uh, try to jump onto their uh, their floating island. The general sort of pace of the game sort of devolves down to trying to gather as many resources as possible and then trying to create sort of a beachhead on the enemy island. Because once you do that, you can spawn as many uh, pieces as you want, as you can afford, on territory that you control so if you control a chunk of their island you can you can spawn units from there and then once you're able to do that it's that's kind of the hard part is getting onto their island but once you can do that it's it's pretty much a wash in your in whoever's favor is over there Just going to be doing some repositioning here. Uh, one of the one of the uh, you can see I just unwittingly demonstrated it right there. One of the biggest sort of uh, nitpicks I have with the game, not really nitpick, but uh, uh, frustration I have with the games is that the once you start a move, you can't cancel it or go back or undo. And that combined with the orthographic perspective of it means that it's it's very easy to misclick and misplace. So you'll notice that I, I wanted to take out that pawn there move by moving diagonally, but I actually moved him adjacent to the pawn. But it worked out, thankfully. So that is that is one of the more frustrating parts of it. Uh, it also kind of affects... Uh, how you should probably do your turn orders where if, if you because the knight can move twice you can't really uh, you can't really say move him once move another piece and then move the knights again you either have to move the entire knights his entire movement or not or you know uh, you have to wait until you can uh, until the next turn but now that you can see that I have a beachhead I have spawned a couple soldiers in order to help out. You can see that the roads are giving me some extra movement, which is quite nice. And uh, as you can see, we're sort of wrapping up the game at this point because we can just spawn all sorts of soldiers on his uh, territory here and we have more resource generation. So the game does quite uh, well combining the strategic elements of moving the pieces around and the resource management aspect of it. A lot of strategy games seem to focus a lot on one or the other, and it's, it's, it's very difficult to see a game properly do both. So it's, it's nice to see a, a little game like that actually accomplish that. Should be done in a few more moves here. And then we will be showing off, again, we'll be showing off the last level of the demo. This right here is the level two. So as you can see, you start off, in this case, you start off with a limited amount of pieces and there are no towers. Now you do actually generate a small amount of resources while you're playing without the towers, but it's, it's not 
it's not a lot you can only have like a couple of pieces every few turns you can see in that little icon box there i actually have um uh showing off all the games available in the demo but yeah that's how last level looks same kind of way you cross the bridges you get to the enemy's territory and you can hopefully spawn enough units to uh, overpower the enemy well let's jump to our third game that richard what has made back in 2001 uh, galactic core a science fiction game this right here is the background for galactic core nothing nothing terribly special you can pause and read the uh, story if you would like but we are just going to jump into the game right away here you have a campaign and a random map. Right now, I you can only I can only play the ter uh, Terran uh, uh, campaign because I'm unregistered. But I don't know if you can even register these games anymore. But this is the random map setup here, uh, and as you can see, it's quite versatile. You can set the size, you can set how many planets you want. Uh, qu quite nice for a smaller game like this. And you can select what side you want to play as. I'm just going to demonstrate, you can see that there are six campaigns. I can't play any of them besides the Turan campaign. So let's start playing as the Tardanian, the Tardanians, I suppose. All six of these factions are actually fairly unique. I'll be going back and showing you uh, the different ships they can have. Most of the, the actual sort of ship setup that they have is fairly fairly similar they all have a colony ship in the lower left they all have a scout ship in the mid left they all have a uh, transport in the lower left the transport is used to capture planets and then they usually have a medium sort of frigates and then they have a, a bigger warship and then a unique ship in the upper right but right now we're going to be mostly uh, using the three starter ships because your science determines uh, what ships you can build. Now we actually spawned right next to an abandoned planet here. I'm colonizing that planet right now. This is the planet uh, screen here. So you can build mines uh, that will kind of fill up those hills. I'm building the mines right now. And you can also build this other thing. It, it, a lot of this stuff is, a, I, don't, I don't quite, it's a little bit unintuitive as it were because it doesn't quite document it as well. Uh, but you can you can get the purple resource by building the other uh, the other building on there. So now we are going to just try to launch a quick attack on the enemy planet here. I'm just trying to knock them out of the game before they spawn 12 ships and kill me. Okay, going to load this guy up with some troops. Now that I have stopped their space defense, we are going to be able to move in. And down on the bottom there, you can see the planetary defenses, and we have captured it. So we're going to build some mines here real quick, and then we are going to replenish the planetary defense force. Now, you also have to build a spaceship in order to actually purchase spaceships from that planet. So again, the, the strategy element of this game is is fairly well designed. We're going to start. I'm going to start actually kind of constructing a fleet now and exploring a bit. But it, the, the actual sort of strategy of it is fairly well designed. Again, the AI is fairly competent, but at the same time, the AI is also fairly efficient. So even at the easiest difficulties, it can get difficult to keep up. The, the general idea, though, is just just construct as many ships as you can. Uh, put them in the biggest stack you can and just sort of stack of doom your way across the map. Building another couple transports here. Or transports? Oh, I should be building scouts. I, I, <laughs> I, I, I accidentally filled that up with transports there. I got a little bit confused. That that would that would explain that would explain some stuff that happens later in the game, but yes, I I now have a fleet of a fleet of transports. Uh, yes. So carrying on, I'm going to start try to start scouting around. Going to try finding new planets, colonize, building up my resources a bit, building up my fleet a bit, and then once we find an enemy, attacking them as well. Now again, with with a lot of with Richard White's other games, there's 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 just one annoying part of it that just kind of now I'm building scouts, now I'm building scouts. Uh, there's one annoying part of it 
where uh, you'll you'll notice it right here, I believe. I have told my ship to move to a space, but he doesn't have enough movement to get to that space. And that space is like two squares away. Now he has a maximum of, I think, four or five movement. When I end my turn, you can see that top ship there moved the two spaces and then ended his turn automatically. So that means I've just I've just lost uh, two potential uh, spaces that I can move. And if I move into an unexplored location or something, you you sort of you you, you can't react to anything. If there's actually an enemy in your way or around you, you can't move your fleet away. It's it's fairly annoying. So now what what I'm what I'm going to start doing is just ending ending the movement. Uh, canceling the movement yeah as you can see it happened again there with that one ship the ships are designated by the circles on the map now the different the different ship types actually do have different circle looks to them the colony ship you can see has a tiny little circle in the center and the transport ships sort of have a secondary ring around them while the attack ships i think only have the outer ring colonizing another planet here going to set up some mines in case we which we probably will encounter some uh, bad guys up there and uh, we aren't seeing it right here but there are a lot of different sort of planetary classes in the game some planets are better for colonizing for mines some planets just don't have a lot of land in general so that they might not even be worth colonizing under most cases and as you can see, we have actually discovered discovered uh, the Oris, who are kind of a uh, uh, sort of bug people, I guess. And as you can see, we just entered into our first battle there. The battles are handled automatically, and I lost three out of my four transports. I, I remember wondering why I lost so many guys, but that because they're transports, that's why. So yes, uh, with the with the combat there, the combat is just you move on to the space. You either it's randomly done. The to, to its credit, it's it's it performs. It, it's done very quickly. It's not like I'm ever going. Gosh, I wish I wish this would hurry up so that I could so that I could uh, uh, you know. It's it's not like the actual movement is a slog in any way. So again, just kind of putting all my money into actually creating ships here. And uh, that is the end of the uh, a lot of turns that we have, unfortunately, to show it off. I was doing quite well there. I, I tend not to do very well with this game, believe it or not. Again, because the AI is just so efficient, that unless you function almost perfectly, you're going to you're going to be sub suboptimal, and the AI is going to be able to take you over but why don't we actually kind of take a look at the variety that the game has i'm going to actually uh go back in here and demonstrate the other factions in the game as you can see there's america and they have different kinds of ships now all the ships they they have stat differences but they also have functional differences too that big ship you just saw there can actually build other ships in the field which is the human unique ship. The Tardinians here. Oh, that's not my planet. The Tardinians, that's not my planet either. The Tardinians have a, a hollow ship that uh, projects a level two frigate, which is just as useful as it sounds, especially since it's still fairly uh, expensive. <laughs> it's not useful at all. Now, Perak. Uh, it's kind of the slow, strong ships. They have like a Perox station. I, I don't exactly know what the unique ability of it is. It just seems that it's a powerful, a powerful, uh, a powerful ship. Now the Tardinians are kind of the fast ones, the fast, weaker ones as well, and the humans are sort of average. The Oris ones, uh, the Oris guy here uh, has a can recover very fast. He has a high shield regeneration rate. That's their unique ability there 
Now, the Carvonians are actually one of the more interesting factions. Uh, you, they have a planet killer that can uh, actually destroy the planet. And they, they also use drones. They use drones a lot, which are very weak. And their transport is actually their level 2 frigate. Except their their frigate is level one, so they have a lot of really good. They have they have a good kind of combination of spammy guys and uh, kind of heavier guys, but they, they aren't they don't have anything that's kind of in the middle. And the Gyrans the Gyrans are they're very funny. Their unique ship is a ship that is weaker than your level one ship, and its perk is that it's cheap. So yeah, you can get to the end of the game and your reward for that is the Garands and your reward for that is a ship that isn't very good. But anyways, that's uh, that's that's it for Richard White's games here. Uh, what is what is the chap doing now? I haven't I haven't been able to find him. I've I've tried looking around. I I think there was a game on on the App Store, the Apple App Store called Galactic Core that was by Richard White, or a Richard White, but it seems to be something different. So, you know, it's, it's, maybe he's still doing games, uh, today. Uh, I haven't been able to see any, but yes, if you did, if you did like this video, I, I do plan on doing some more classic games here from the Mac OS 9 era, and if you, if you have any that you want to see Let's Play or commented on, Feel free to let me know. Not not all of them will be a sort of just kind of a bite-sized chunk of uh, their several games over the years. I do plan on doing a long play of some of some other games that I know of growing up. It's just that this one, because they were all demos and because he they they get fairly repetitive after a while, I just kind of did the bite-sized chunk approach for Richard White here. But anyways, thanks for watching, folks. I do hope that you enjoyed it. And uh, maybe you'll even be interested in uh, looking into getting these games yourself. I'll have the links to Macintosh Garden and the Sheep Shaver emulator that you can use to play them in the description of the video. And I look forward to seeing you next time here.